morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Keaton. I'm the director here at Somerset Career and Technical Center. And I, I'd like to uh, welcome you all for uh, coming here this morning. And also, I'd like to extend our appreciation for the governor and the commissioner for uh, coming here this morning as well. Um, one of the things that we're, uh, we're very vital in terms of doing with our career and technical education is our role that we play in economic development. And right now, the way things look for our economy, uh, our students that attend our programs, and a very proud of the fact that we have, uh, have the potential of earning anywhere from five to $15,000 to the counterparts upon completion of our programs. Where 40% of the workforce right now is poised to be retiring in the next five years, we play a vital role in that, in that position. So we are very pleased to uh, uh, play a, a, a role in any way we can for economic development. And, and we're there for our participation within that. Um, we play a role into the uh, Somerset uh, uh, Workforce Development Team, and our role with uh, training our students is in course of what happens with that. So with that, I would like to, uh, again, extend our appreciation for all of you coming this morning, and as well as uh, for the Governor and Commissioner for um, wanting to come to our, our center and visit us. So I'd like to introduce Governor Paul Page. Dave, thank you so much for allowing us to come here and to uh, talk about education and our education program as we move forward. Uh, we've been visiting a lot of tech centers around the state. And I'll tell you, this may not be the, the fanciest building in the state's in the building, but it's not about the building. It's about what's inside the building and what comes out of the education of the students here. The one thing that our administration is going to do is concentrate on the students first. And not everyone learns uh, through books. And all too often in the last 25 years we've forgotten about trades and vocation in the state of Maine. And the kids here, if you just go in that other room, it just will show you what we're capable of doing if we put our minds to it. These kids are truly inspired by what they do. And that goes a long, long ways. Inspiration is really 90% of that. I'm real pleased that Commissioner Bowen that virtually dedicated the first year of our administration in studying and focusing on the direction of education here in the state. He's going to unveil today where we want to go as an administration. But more importantly than that, he is committed to the same thing that, that I've that our whole administration has been committed to. It's all about the student. It's not about us. It's not about the, the building. It's not about the teachers, although we need the very best teachers and the most effective teachers leading our students in front of the classroom. However, it is about the student. Now, I'm a woodworker. I love to do woodwork. I build furniture. And I will tell you, anybody tells you you don't need math or geometry to build furniture. And that's basically, I took geometry in, in, in school and didn't know it. I never put it to use until I tried to build a piece of furniture. And then you know how important it is to understand math and geometry and angles. So we are dedicated to moving the state forward. And in order to move the state forward, we need one thing, a very talented workforce. And where best to get them is in our schools. And all too often, we've allowed the trains to go to the back of the building. And I will tell you this, for all your students that are here, whether you're in 
you work in wood, metal, uh, welding, uh, arts. There are many, many great opportunities. And some people will call them good jobs. I would call them good careers. Pratt and Whitney down in, in Berwyn. You go in there and within a couple of months you're making $20, $25 an hour. I'll tell you, that's good, not just in Maine. That's excellent in Maine. But that's good any place in the country. Uh, culinary arts, as you can see, I like food. <laughs> and uh, we, we have got what I consider one of the greatest chefs at, at the Blaine House. <coughs> this is from Waterfall. And he's absolutely terrific. In fact, I told some of the technical schools we were going to blow him out as a guest chef to go around the different technical schools and culinary programs around the state because he is just amazing. So it doesn't, you don't have to be uh, an arts major, literature, and all these, these great things liberal arts schools provide. And then when they get out of school, and I'm not knocking academics, but I have a, a very good friend of mine who has uh, his son is studying to be a history major. And so I asked him, I said, so you're going to be a teacher? No, oh, I couldn't stand be up front and teach, teach a bunch of kids. Oh, okay, so you're going to go political science? Nope. Take politics. Hmm. Why are you taking history? <clears throat> he loves history, but he hasn't thought about it later on when he was up in the workforce. So I really believe the technical colleges the uh, community colleges, the CTE schools around the state are really vital for a state that is a natural resource based state. And so we need the skills. And uh, Somerset is doing a great job. So, what I'll do now is I'll allow the commissioner, who's really done an awful lot of work in the whole area of education, to come and unveil what we're going to be doing this year. And when I say it's about the students, we're talking about making sure that each student gets the education that he or she wants, not superintendents of schools telling them what they need to study. And so we're going to do everything we possibly can to give them the broadest scope of opportunities and pick the course of study that they like. And so with that, I'll introduce Commissioner Bowen, who incidentally was one of those effective teachers. <laughs> the teacher evaluation superb with you, by the way. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and, and thanks, uh, everybody, for having us here. I was up here a few weeks ago talking with the CT directors, and it's just it's great. It's great to be in this facility. I love this backdrop back here. I have a car, by the way, that I may bring in here later, because there's something rattling on my way up here. Um, as the governor uh, made clear, uh, his instruction to me and, and to my team uh, in the development of the legislation that we wanted to put forward this session was to keep one thing in mind, and that's what's in the best interest of the students. What is right for kids? End of story. Uh, and as all of you know, for many, many years, for as long as any of us can remember, we've had a school system that was basically structured around what made sense administratively, what was sort of easy to implement administratively. So, you know, school children uh, attend the school that they attend because of their street address, not because this, that school necessarily is the best setting, although oftentimes it is. Uh, we determine where a kid goes to school by which side of certain town lines they live on. Uh, students are grouped for instruction uh, by their birthdays. We put them together, all the five-year-olds together in kindergarten, uh, the ones born between this particular day and this particular day, and then we lock them into that age-based cohort, and that's how they move through their entire academic career. Not based on what they need academically, not based on how fast they can move or whether they need to work on something in a different way. Uh, it's an age-based cohort because it's easy to do administratively. Uh, when school starts in the morning is determined by bus schedule. Uh, 
not determined by when kids learn best necessarily, it's when administratively it's easy to get buses here. Uh, and we all know that when school ends, it's determined by the athletic schedule. So that's when kids need to get to practice, that's when we get school done to make sure they can get there. Uh, so, and you know, we have a single curriculum that we built uh, that is used to try and meet the needs of all kids. And we take our kids and our educators, by the way, and we insert them into this system and we tell them you're going to have to meet these very high standards using a system that's not built around you, a system that's built administratively. Uh, and kids get frustrated and teachers, I can speak personally, get tremendously frustrated being locked into a system like that that doesn't let, give them the flexibility to do what they need to do to meet the needs of kids. So what we're presenting today is a handful of bills that we think are going to take some more uh, steps to build some flexibility into this system so that students have access to the educational setting and experience that's going to best meet their needs. Uh, and appropriate enough being here today, the first bill we're going to put forward is related to career technical education. As the governor said, we know that career technical education is a tremendous educational experience for kids. Uh, we were down in Bangor at the, at the CT Center down there earlier this week. I've been traveling around the state to a lot of them. Uh, but we do know that there are barriers that exist that sometimes get in the way of, of our kids being able to get to these centers, transportation barriers, schedule barriers, and things like that. So we're going to be put forward, uh, putting forward a piece of legislation that asks our school districts, the school districts that share a CTE center, uh, to develop a common school calendar so the kids are all uh, where they need to be on the same day. Right now we know, talking to the site directors, uh, that it's very tough when different school districts that send to a CTE center on different school calendars. You never know when you come in here as a CTE instructor whether you're going to have all your kids, some of your kids, half your kids. Uh, and so we think we need to get the adults around the table uh, to figure out how to build a common calendar so that it works uh, better for kids. We also want to work with the high schools and CTE centers to make sure that credits transfer easily between those two uh, institutions so that when kids are taking academic courses at the CTE centers that those credits transfer easily. We know that uh, the CTE centers sometimes will offer sort of regular high school type classes so the kids can take those while they're at the CTE center and it helps with scheduling but sometimes we have problems with credit transfer so we want to dig into that issue a little bit. And we've been doing some tremendous work with the Maine Community College System. We've had a number of meetings with President Fitzsimmons who is 100% committed to this uh, and we've talked about ways that we can improve uh, the, the relationship and the connection between our career technical education centers and the community college system so that kids who are part of nationally certified, uh, really rigorous standards-based programs here at the CTE centers can get credit for their work that transfers to the community college system. And when they get to the community college system, they have some credits in their pocket already and they can continue with their education. Uh, and the, uh, I'll tell you that President Simmons is committed to that. We're going to set up a process. Uh, whereby the two, uh, the, by the community, uh, the department, the CT centers, community college system work together to align programs and make sure that kids uh, who graduate from here in a really rigorous program get those credits transferred. So we think this is a great opportunity to take a few steps that we think are going to eliminate some barriers uh, and make it easier for kids to access facilities like this. So before I move on, we've got a couple of students we want to hear from uh, related to the CTE piece. So I'm going to introduce first Michaela to come up and give us a couple words about how CTE has been working for us. Good morning, my name is Michaela Cowett. I'm a senior at the electrical program here at Somerset Terrain Technical Center. At SCT, we study a wide range of topics within our program. The electrical and electrical we learn commercial, but mostly residential, and the National Electrical Code. In the first year of this program, one will attain an electrician's helper's license and an OSHA 10 card. These allow you to work alongside an electrician in an entry level position. The trades that are taught at SCTC are trades that are still in demand today. They are relevant and useful. If students start learning these trades at an earlier age, they will have more experience and be better prepared to grow into our community. To me, SCTC's way of learning is more beneficial than traditional schools. We are not only learning in classrooms, but we get the opportunity to apply what we've learned in a real world setting. I found the hands-on approach much easier to understand and to retain. Just because you enroll in a career technical education program doesn't mean you have to go into that field. It also doesn't mean that you are destined for a community college. In speaking with other universities, they agree a CTE program would be beneficial in my pursuit for an engineering degree. I have recently been accepted to Maine Maritime Academy and the Mark Institute of Technology. This center has definitely changed my outlook on technical centers and the students I produce. I am proud to say I'm a vote kid. Thank you. Congratulations, and don't give up on that electrician, electrician career, because 
How can you, you can't even find electricians anymore. So <laughs> don't rule that out, but congratulations on the maritime family. That's tremendous. So next we're going to hear from Rob Morrison, who's also going to talk to us a little bit about his experience. Okay. Yeah. Hello, my name is Rob Morrison. I grew up local here in Norwich Rock. I went to high school here in Scout Hegan. My junior and senior year, I attended the CTC program here, the IST program, Information Technology Program. Later evolved into college, where I graduated from Thomas College in Waterville with a bachelor's degree in information technology. While there, I did an internship with Skowigan Savings Bank, and that is my current employer. At CTC, it was a great opportunity for me. I really got a chance to explore career opportunities and discover that I could really have a career in technology. At the time, you know, I liked working with computers and technology, and I really didn't know what to do with that and you know family and friends teachers are asking what are you going to do for a career what are you going to do and it was really at the end of my sophomore year that I began investigating the CTC program here and what a great opportunity it was for me I developed skills that helped me in college and in my career I'm currently an AVP at Skywagon Savings Bank I'm a network administrator I really enjoy my job and it's mostly because of the skills that I developed here early on that helped me really push through my college and my career. Um, one of the projects that I worked on here that really, it simulates very well what a working environment is for me. I developed a web page with another student that was a newsletter that the district could use. And we got to present the website, and it was just a great experience for me and the other student to really just see the skills that I'm learning here and being put use into a, you know, a website that people can go and see news about the district. It's just a really satisfying thing to see the skills you're learning here in this program and to see them being useful in your life. So um, with that, I'd like to thank CTC for inviting me back to speak here. It's been a pleasure, and I'm very proud to be a part of the program. Thank you. We're going to make sure we have more students at these and less politicians, I think. <laughs> so, thank you both for, for helping out with this. Um, and what you heard is, how do we create more learning opportunities? How do we reach kids where they are? Uh, and that's about creating options and creating more opportunities and more ways for kids to access the learning option that's going to be the best for them. So the second piece of, we've got two other pieces of legislation related to school choice and expanding access to school choice opportunities for kids and making sure that kids have other opportunities outside their local school district if for whatever reason, despite the best efforts of the folks that work in their local schools, they've got theirs a setting out there or an approach uh, that's going to better meet their needs. So the first bill we're going to talk about, and we'll have this, all the bill language we're finishing up this week, we should have it first of the week. Uh, will create what's called an open enrollment option. There's 17 states around the country that have this kind of an option. And essentially what it would do is allow school districts uh, to open their enrollment to students outside uh, their school district area. Uh, so it doesn't require that they take kids, but it, it allows uh, school districts the opportunity to say, you know, we've got room in our facility for a few more kids. Maybe we can take uh, 10 more freshmen or 15 more freshmen, or we can take some extra kids uh, in our second grade or something like that. They could then put that information out. They could say, these are the slots that we think we're going to have in the fall that we'd like to attract other kids. If kids are interested, here's what we have to offer. And then kids from other districts outside that district would be able to apply and be able to attend that school. So it's really a way uh, that we can expand options. It's about putting options and opportunities out for kids. Uh, we're going to set it up in such a way that, that it's all done very publicly. Uh, if uh, the number of kids exceeds the number of slots that are available to a certain kid, the number of kids who apply exceed the number of kids uh, for whom there are slots available, they'd set up, we'd set up a lottery random draw system uh, so we don't have school districts cherry-picking students from here and there uh, and getting the best basketball players or the best math students. Uh, we want to be sure it's a fair process uh, that's really going to allow options uh, for kids. And as I said before, we've got 17 other states around the country uh, we spent a lot of time looking at Michigan's law. That's the law that we really uh, looked at, uh, that we thought was a great model. And so we're going to sort of build that out, and we'll have some more details on that uh, as the bill comes out uh, first of the week. Uh, the second bill we're going to move uh, is going to remove an existing prohibition against the use of public tuition dollars for religious <coughs> schools that would otherwise meet all the other state standards for the receipt of public funding. 
Uh, as most of you know, we have private schools across Maine, the town academies, they're typically called, that receive public funding uh, to educate students in these private schools. So the towns send tuition dollars, uh, and these private schools educate students. In our state statute, there's a whole long list of things that these private schools have to do in order to receive that public tuition money. There's school approval, there's all kinds of uh, standards that they need to meet. It's, it's very rigorous. We only have really a handful of private schools across the state uh, that have access to public tuition dollars. One line of that statute says they may not be religious. So we're going to propose that that piece of blank, that one single line of statute be taken out. Now what that would mean is a school that was a religious school, but was otherwise uh, had, did all of the other things they needed to do to get private school approval uh, for receiving public tuition dollars, they would have access to do that. So again, it's about expanding opportunity. When I was first in the legislature, in the 121st legislature, 2002-03, we had this bill, came before the legislature then. It did not pass, but it did get bipartisan support. And a very, very good discussion on the floor, I recall, uh, around making sure that kids, talking about having opportunities for kids and ways that those kids can, uh, can get an, an option that may be the best thing for them in terms of their educational opportunities. Uh, and again, this is about expanding opportunity and expanding choices. Lastly, uh, we've got one other bill, uh, and we know uh, that building an effective system of schooling is going to meet the needs of all kids means having effective teachers and school leaders in every single school in our state. Uh, the governor and I spent a lot of time in the summer and fall looking over reports of uh, high-performing school systems around the world, the Singapores, the South Koreas, the Finlands, uh, and if there's a common theme that runs through all of the reporting about the highly effective school systems we see around the world that are really doing great work, it is a relentless focus on making sure that teachers uh, and school leaders are well-trained, well-supported, have the training resources they need to succeed. Uh, and so we want to focus on that. So we're actually, I don't I have the governor cover his ears here, but we're actually to some degree following the lead of President Obama and Secretary Duncan on this, who have put forth, I know, who put <laughs> forward, he grunted a little bit, doesn't he? Uh, they did put forward in the No Child Left Behind flexibility uh, piece that was released last fall, really want states to focus on teacher and leader effectiveness. It's a big part of where we think the United States government is going. As No Child Left Behind gets reauthorized, Congress is talking about this. So we want to get out in front and really focus on teacher and leader effectiveness. So the core part of this bill will be asking school districts, working with school districts over the next couple of years, to build uh, new and better uh, teacher and leader evaluation systems. Uh, so these are the ways that we go in and we, we see how well teachers are doing, uh, and our school leaders are doing, we get information about what extra training opportunities they may need as a result of that. We put that information together we, and we get the kind of training and support for our teachers that they need to have. So what we would do in, as part of this bill is we'd set up a process to adopt standards for teacher and leader effectiveness to say this is what effective teaching and school leadership looks like. There are national standards already in place that we'll probably work from. Uh, we would require uh, the districts, we would adopt a set of standards around evaluation systems and we would work with districts, require them to take the teacher evaluation and principal evaluation systems they have and, and connect them to the set of standards that we would adopt. Uh, and the goal again is to get great feedback back to our teachers about what they can do to improve and feedback to our school administrators and school leaders about what kind of training opportunities they need to provide our teachers. Uh, as I can tell you, as, as someone who taught in classrooms for 10 years, uh, I have my, I still have back at the house, my stack of little evaluations for when I was teaching. Uh, I don't know that I got any value out of those experiences. Those of you who are teachers know how it goes. Somebody comes in, they observe, they fill out the little sheet, they meet within the office, here's, here's what you did, I thought it was great, uh, you know, change your bulletin boards, and thanks. Um, and we need to build a much more rigorous system. Uh, this is a national effort. We've got uh, states working very hard on this. Uh, so we're going to do uh, work with all of the, uh, our stakeholders, our teachers, and everybody else in building a system around that. Additionally, uh, we want to go into our state certification law and do some work around alternative certification. As many of you know, we have a system now where you've sort of got to jump through quite a lot of hoops in order to get into one of our, uh, into a teaching position in this state. We want to create a streamlined process where folks who maybe are mid-career folks uh, who are thinking about a teaching career uh, can uh, and who have you know the academic and, and the content area knowledge uh, would be able to sort of get into uh, our schools, work with master teachers, work with mentor teachers, work with a really strong support training program uh, that can get them into the classroom where they don't have to go through uh, so many of the hoops that we have that we sometimes erect 
uh, that make it difficult to attract people into teaching. We've got all kinds of people across our state. All of us know them, uh, folks, friends of ours, who we know will be tremendous teachers, uh, even if they came in just to teach here in this facility or teach a couple of classes. Uh, but we erect a lot of barriers to keep those people out, and we want to take a long look at that, work with some folks nationally who've done a lot of work on this, and, and create a, a, a much better process. We've got a couple other pieces related to teacher certification. Uh, we've got some loopholes and things that we want to go through and really spend some time working on that. Uh, but the, t the goal of this, this bill is to focus uh, exclusively on how do we ensure uh, that we've got great teachers in our schools and that we're able to provide those teachers with the training and support they need. Uh, we'll be talking a little later on about some initiatives that we're going to put forward around uh, creating some regional capacities, maybe creating some We've talked about regional teacher development centers that would be able to provide a lot of support for teachers, uh, get that professional development and training right in the classroom where those teachers are. So we're going to be building out some of those pieces down the road as well. So again, uh, this is a pretty ambitious set of bills, as you can see. Uh, but uh, it's really driven by what we're seeing in terms of nationally, what other high-performing systems around the country are doing. And again, it comes back to what the governor said at the beginning, which is to put the students at the center of all of our thinking and making sure that every single kid gets the educational experience that's going to work for them. Uh, and that means presenting, having lots of opportunities, lots of choices, lots of avenues for kids to grow and learn and explore, and making sure that we have the absolute best teachers and school administrators in our buildings that we possibly can get and doing everything we can do to support them. So those are going to be our big goals in this legislative session. Uh, we're really looking forward to the discussion to come and working with all of our stakeholders to, to do what we can to improve, uh, make our schools the best uh, in the world. So I'll, I'll stop there and we can take some questions unless we've got someplace else we need to go. Oh, Dave, I'm sorry. Did you have anything? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great, so take a couple of questions and then I think we're going to go take a little walk around and, and let these kids get back to work. There's a lot of stuff back here that looks like it needs to be worked on. Steve, Jake, you have yeah, questions sure. on, the, uh, on the open enrollment piece. Uh, how would you ensure, uh, uh, if you go ahead and do that, that um, certain districts that, that are currently struggling in the state, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they don't sort of become ghettoized, they don't, you know, have such a flight of people that they, you know, how do you can help districts that, that are struggling? Well, just be, well you, this is going to help districts that are struggling. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I went to Penobscot Elementary School. I'm a Penobscot, Hancock County kid. Now, Penobscot Elementary School has seen declining enrollment over the years. You know, it's a district, that, that whole area really is sort of struggling to keep its schools open. We see this as an opportunity for Penobscot to say, you know what, we have 20 extra slots in our school, we can take 20 more kids, here are the programs that we have, here are some programs that maybe are different than the surrounding schools have, and maybe they can attract some kids who think, you know, that's maybe a better opportunity. They've got something that this school over here doesn't have, maybe that's a better opportunity for me. So we see this as a way of, of having these schools, schools that maybe have seen shrinking enrollment, to be able to, to uh, open up their doors to kids from from other districts and, and provide those kind of opportunities. You know, we're, we're thinking that down the road you may have districts working together, uh, so the school has a program over here and another school has a different program, so you can, schools can specialize a little bit, uh, and it's really about creating lots of different opportunities. And because we're going to put provisions in that prevent cherry picking is the term that we use, where schools are not going to be able to go in and say, I'm taking that kid but not this kid, or that kid but not this kid. Uh, it's, it's not going to allow districts to go in and sort of pull out the best math students or the big football players or whatever. Uh, it really is going to be a fair, open process that's about creating opportunities for kids. And will there be, uh, I assume there'll be uh, some districts like uh, our, you know, where I live, like RSC 20, Belfast area, they're still talking about consolidation. Yep. Well, well, this will dovetail in some way with those ongoing. Well, it certainly will be part of the discussion as they think about how do they deal with the schools that they have, do they build more schools, do they merge the schools that they have, do they close schools and consolidate schools. I mean, part of the discussion would be, do we have programs here that are unique that maybe would attract students? So for instance, in that area, maybe Belfast High School has some programs that are unique to that area. Sears Board is doing some different things. That's kind of a different instructional approach. Maybe that's better for kids. And those schools can uh, can open their enrollment and kids can, kids can have an opportunity to go, well, I want to go to Belfast because they're doing really great stuff around in this area, or I want to go to Searsport because they're doing something else. So we think it's an opportunity to, to create a lot uh, uh, more choices for kids. Sorry, and I don't mean to hog this, but one quick last question on, yeah. uh, on the, the voucher. The, uh, the, uh, no voucher. Yeah, no, no voucher, sorry. The, the uh, cho choice piece on yep. the, the schools. You know, obviously there's some who just philosophically feel like 
uh, that, that, that you know, there's no business sending government money mm -hmm. to support a disruption of religious institutions. Philosophical difference, yep. what, I mean, what would you say to that? I would say that the focus all the way through this is what's in the best interest of the kids. It's how do we make sure that kids have a lot of opportunities. And right now we have a piece of law that discriminates against families that have made the, that that believe that their student would be best served at a religious school. We support private schools. Private schools get public funding all across the state. The town academies have been here for 200 years now. Uh, but we have a piece of law, by the way, that hasn't been here since the dawn of time. It was enacted in 1981. So prior to 1981, this was not an issue. Kids could attend uh, religious schools that were otherwise approved for, for tuition purposes. The, the legislature took an action, passed a, a change to the statute that, for, that prohibited that in 1981. Uh, Public funding for religious schools has been upheld by, by the United States Supreme Court in the Zellman decision. So we know that it's constitutional. So it really is to work, let's go back and revisit that decision that the legislature made in 1981 and decide, is it in the best interest of kids? Is it in the best interest of kids to say, kids, you have all these choices of schools to go to except those ones? Thanks. Do you have an idea of how many religious schools there are that would suddenly be getting this funding and how... How much does that spread out, the state funding, and where is the money going to come from? The, the, well, it depends on who would be able to meet that set of standards. And we don't have schools that are, those religious schools aren't applying for the, for, to meet those standards. Now, we know that we have sort of the, you know, the Chevrolet and the sort of big, big religious schools that probably would meet most of those standards. They're, you know, they're, they're, uh, because of the way the standards are written, it's really for schools that offer complete school programs and all of the rest of that. So my guess is you wouldn't have more than a handful in Maine that probably would meet that threshold. But we've never tested that because we've, we've forbidden it from, from happening. But we know, we know prior to 1981, we had public tuition dollars going to, to those schools that met that standard. Remember, this is not you decide that you want to open a school uh, down the street in your house and call it a religious school, and all of a sudden you're going to get funding for that. This is you've got to meet all of the rigorous standards. We have, we have private schools all over the state but a very small number are approved to receive public tuition dollars. It's a small, it's essentially the town academies, uh, which of course have been here since, since 18th century. Steve, <clears throat> yep. I have two questions. As a former teacher, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Gerald Vine with Durango yeah. Blue. Uh, as a former teacher, you know that there's much more involved with how a student performs than just the teacher yep. in the classroom. Yep. So you're talking about these new standards. How will you take into account all of the different factors uh, in regards to using the student performance as rating teachers? Well, that's, that's a discussion that's going on nationally because you've got districts, you've got states all over the country looking at how do you use that student performance data. Uh, so I think we're going to have the benefit of the experience of a lot of other states who have been doing this work. And what you see is states looking at things like growth models, where you take into consideration maybe the socioeconomic background of the student, where, what, what was the student's skill and abilities when they came into your classroom and then you track a growth model from there and you use some of the new, really rigorous assessment, new assessment systems that we have. Um, you've, got other, uh, you've got other states that look at other indicators of that, that pull that into that data system. Uh, we have very robust data systems now that we can collect a lot of information about where kids are, what kind of growth they've seen over the years. Uh, we had some folks up from Massachusetts not too long ago talk about their system where what they do there is they take a kid and they compare that kid to other kids like that kid in other areas of the state because all that data comes to the state and they can say this student started from here and went to here students like that had this kind of growth and they put a growth indicator into that so there's a lot of different ways to do this uh, we're we're talking here about implementing this over the course of a couple of years so it's really about us working for the next year to look at those standards to try and work with our stakeholders to develop what those standards are giving our districts another year to implement develop pilot uh, run those, try them out, try them out for another year with full implementation about three years down the road once we've had an opportunity to build out the data systems, all the growth model stuff that we need to do, uh, all the assessment, we know we've got new assessment systems coming, so there's a lot of sort of, there's a lot of pieces moving here at once that we need to try and tie together as we go so that by the time we get to about the 2014-15 school year, we'll have these standards-based uh, evaluation systems in place, we'll have the data systems, we'll have the student performance data, we'll have all the algorithms that we need to calculate all of that, we've got all the other data systems coming in. So it's, it's going to be a tremendous amount of work, but we've got people all over the country working on it. It's a tremendous amount of work being done. Okay. And then what's the reasoning behind um, like a statewide standards for um, uh, the VOTEC for these uh, 
these these schools? Oh, for these schools? Yeah. I think it's what we what we want to do when I when we talked to the community college system, they said, you know, we know that we've got uh, we've got CTE centers that are doing tremendous work, and they're they're really reaching industry benchmarks. So this is a key thing for the work that the CTE centers do that they want to be sure that when their kids leave here, they've got an industry training that they need that's being recognized by the industry. The industry is saying to us, and, and the governor said it, when you go talk to businesses, when you go down and talk to Pratt & Whitney, you talk to machine school guys, they'll say, we need kids that can meet this set of standards. And so now there are different levels, the schools? Well, I think, you, yeah, you've got different standards, and what we want to try and do is sort of, there's actually another piece of legislation that's, that's a department bill that's related to those standards piece. And how do we make sure that we've got all of our, and support all our CT centers as they make sure their programs meet those industry standards. Uh, and then what we want to do, the, the part I mentioned about working with the community college system, is the community college system is prepared to say, if a student graduates from this facility and has met these national industry standards, we are prepared to give that student college credit for the work they did right here at the CTE center. And that means that kid can go right into the community college system if they choose to have some credits under their belt already that came to them at no cost, and then can continue on with their educations and achieve, go whatever direction they want to go, as we just heard. But it's about, you know, we have standards for the academic side, you know, the learning results, we've established all that. Uh, on the CT side, it's about national industry standards. What is the industry telling us these kids that go through this program need to know and be able to do when they, when they get done? So that's what we're talking about. Commissioner, thank you. Everybody, thank you for the questions. We've got to get the governor and the commissioner on the tour real quick. Again, thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody.